Good morning, everybody here in the Documentation Center in Berlin and also on uh, worldwide uh, on YouTube. My short uh, question to the organizers, should we start or are we waiting for someone to join the public? Yeah, we can start. Okay, okay. Great, so um, I'm very happy to welcome our four panelists here in Berlin, Hans-Christian Trepte, Dieter Pohl, Jörg Moré, and uh, Alexander Osipian. Well pronounced? Yeah. And we are happy to have an Ukrainian scholar with us this morning. And uh, we are happy actually to discuss uh, the topic which is uh, on the core of our conference uh, topic with a different perspective on this question of weaponization of history. I would like to invite you to have some uh, questions right after the presentations, some true questions to the speakers, and then at the end we will have a common discussion about all the four papers. To start, I would like to introduce uh, Hans-Christian Trepte. He is a literary scholar affiliated throughout decades to Leipzig University. He studied English-American studies and Slavic studies in Greifswald, Leipzig, Warsaw, and Wrocław. His specialization is in West Slavic literature and cultural history with a focus on Polish history and also as a translator of Polish literature. He has, of course, numerous publications, and now I lost my note about his latest one. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, several, uh, numerous publications on Slavic literatures, on cultures, on migrations and immigration, language change, German-Slavic reciprocity. And um, a very popular title which came out last year is called, I say it in German first, Zwischen Kap Arkona und dem Lausitzer Bergland, Westslawische Mythologie. So between the uh, Cape Arkona and the Lucian uh, Mountains, West Slavonic Mythology, edited uh, in Leipzig 2022. Hans Christian Trepte, you have the floor for your presentation on Kievan Rus between myth and the claim to power. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, all early birds. Uh, I'm sorry, I had problems with my computer, which was several times hacked, and therefore no visual effects. You just have to listen to my words. Myths are closely bound to cultural heritage. They may also bring about political actions, armed conflicts, and even wars. But let me first of all introduce some remarks on shared cultural heritage as a problem dealing, first of all, with a remaining past. It is an interacting with a common cultural heritage, its national participations, interpretations, and perspectives. Actually, it provokes new debates and tensions in relation with the question, whose heritage is it? Thus, we may understand cultural heritage as a result of transcultural and transregional exchanges of ethnic, cultural, religious diversities and identities. It is a tangled history that connects and divides simultaneously. Often, centuries of foreign dominations and internal divisions have left countries and cultures in a precarious position in a state of in-betweenness. The more different states and peoples share a common cultural heritage, the more negotiations and moderations are needed. In the majority, all participating sides are eager to dominate the meaning and interpretation. Cultural heritage has also served as a means of affirming a characteristic unity of a state of a territory, an ethnicity, and culture, since it is closely linked to the building of nation states and the construction of national collective 
identities. This is also the reason why heritage and identity have become part of complex structure, guaranteeing first of all internal stability, stability as well as an external strength to the detriment of both parties. In case of new political constellations, when territories fall apart and new identities follow, the common heritage is associated first of all with the ethnic group that has cast off. Therefore, heritage sites can serve as catalysts for new controversies or armed conflicts. That's why Russia and Ukraine are trapped in an often idealized past, as well as in medieval myth. A once shared common past underpins the conflict additionally. One of many conflicts is the myth of Kievan Rus. As a result of the Cossack Rising of 1648, led by Bohdan Khmelnytsky, the Ukraine was divided. The concept of two different Ukraines came into existence. It was literary, designed in an essay by the prominent Ukrainian intellectual Mykola Ryabchuk. The Ukraine, one state, two countries. Historical narratives and powerful myths are crucial for the imagined community of the, uh, the Ukrainian nation. Myths of cultural and ethnic origin, myth of national revival, of national character, myths of the other. It may be just an invention or probably rather a reconstruction of historical, political, and cultural realities. Was the national idea of one Ukraine conceived only in 1991? Or does it go back to a national Ukrainian movement in Western Ukraine aiming at an independent Ukrainian state? Or does it originate in the Kiev and Rus? As a matter of fact, an independent Ukrainian republic came into existence as a result of the Russian October Revolution in 1917. After the peace treaty of Riga in 1721, Ukraine was divided again. The western part was incorporated by Poland and eastern central Ukraine became a Soviet republic. In 1954, it was Nikita Khrushchev presenting the Crimean Insula as a gift to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic, a highly controversial and polarizing matter. The following annexation of the Crimea, Crimea in uh, 2014 by Putin's Russia was interpreted as an important step towards the unification of whole Russia. Within Ukraine, conflicts arose mainly between patriotic supporters of a close integration with the West and staunch supporters of Russia. The Ukrainian Euromaidan was perceived by Russia as a dangerous threat to the Russian world, Ruski Mir, and the unity of all East Slavonic peoples. In 2021, Putin had published a long essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, laying out his underlying rationale for a war against Ukraine. The controversial essay was interpreted as a key guide to the historical stories and interpretations that characterize mainly Putin's attitude toward Ukraine. That's also why Russians and Ukrainians are seen as related peoples or as two brother nations or even as a homogeneous ethnic and cultural group in a holy trinity of Vilogorossi, Great Russians, Malorossi, Little Russians, and Belarusi, White Russians. All three fraternal nations claim the ancient Rus 
as their historical, political, and cultural ancestor, as the origin of their statehood and national identity. And Putin endorses this kind of thinking constantly. Like the Russian Tsars traditionally felt since 1547, also Putin feels like a rule, ruler of Seya Rusi, of all Russia and the Russian world. Following the annexation of Crimea, Putin stressed the historical importance of the reunification as a coming back home again to Russia. National currents in Russia may rely on an alleged inseparable part of the historical and cultural Russian heritage of the Rus. On the other hand, national Ukrainian historiography uses the whole course of history of Ukrainian ground and the history, the historical territory of the Kiev and Rus for an interrupted national evolution. In this way, Rus was also used as a living myth, as a claim of power by the Russian and Ukrainian side. In the 18th century, the Russian Tsars tried to establish Kiev as the cradle of Russian orthodoxy, as a center of the whole Russian empire. As early as in the 17th century, and even before, we may also state the emergence of another myth, the myth of a Ruthenian identity based mainly on Orthodox religion. This includes historical persons like Vladimir or Volodymyr the Great, seen as the founder of the Russian as well as of the Ukrainian state. In 2016, there was erected a huge monument to him in Moscow. 16 meters high. At its inauguration, Vladimir Putin stated that with the important historical figure of Vladimir the Great, there was laid the foundation of the United Russian nation, as well as of a uni unified and strong Russia. In 1853, the Tsarist Russia had already raised a monument 20 meters high at the bench of the Dnieper River. Russia also insists on a continuous historical, cultural, religious, and political development ranging from Rus and the Tsarist Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, to the Russian Federation today. But also Ukraine tries to establish a continuous historical process from Kiev and Rus, the hetmanate of the Zaporozhsky Cossacks, the Ukrainian People's Republic within the Soviet Union to the independent Ukrainian state today. This concept is also reflected by the statement of Ukraine's independence of August 24, 1991, referring to a history and a state of, of more than 1,000 years. In Russia, the canonized prince Alexander Nevsky turned over the years into the most identification figures, whereas in Ukraine it was Prince Danilo of Galicia and Volhynia who was crowned by the legate Opio de Mezzano, king of Rus, Rex Russie. Prince Danilo is regarded as a symbol of Ukraine's sense of belonging to the West to Latin Europe. In the center of Lviv, we may find his monument. We will find his portrait on Ukrainian coins, and last but not least, the airport of Lviv was named after him, Danilo Halitsky International Airport. Functionalized myths can be used for political aims and imperial claims of power with fatal consequences. The Russian invasion on Ukraine is a convincing proof how a shared common heritage can be misused for dangerous imperial ambitions. That's why it is urgent to understand the history and culture of Rus 
for place, placing the Russian-Ukrainian conflict in a proper historical context. As a matter of fact, Kievan Rus was an integral part of medieval Europe, but it was neither Russia nor Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans Christian, for this um, short and very pointed speech to show uh, how easy it is actually to use myths, myths and cultural heritage for own political purposes. And um, still, I would like to ask you, at the current situation, who is more, uh, how to say, <laughs> How, how would you, uh, on which side you are if concerning the question to claim power with this Kievan Rus myth? It is a difficult question and a question I dislike <laughs> <laughs> because it is often, I was raised up in, in East Germany and this was a common question, on which side are you, are you on the side of a better future, of peace, or are you on the side of imperialism and war? Yeah? Uh, often it's so that we have to, to answer such, such a question with neither nor. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. This is also what I wanted to point out, because we may interpret history from our point of view, which has changed after the Zeitenwende. Yeah? And this is also the discussion. If we as scholars have the right uh, to questionize our uh, things we stated before, we have to rethink it. But if we always have to change it, I'm not sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there uh, any immediate questions or remarks to the paper of uh, Hans Christian Trepte? Okay, seems like everybody wants to get more input first. Yeah? Only one small input. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. The question was, how did I come to, to uh, uh, tyrannize such a subject? I wrote a longer text on uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and this is very uh, similar. Whose heritage is it? Is it Lithuanian, which was a much bigger state than Poland, Shouldn't it be the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth? Yeah. So it is a, a very similar question. For a long time, it was only I was on the Polish side, just to answer your, your <laughs> question. And later on, I stated, no, I also have to see the Lithuanian point of view. Thank you. Yeah. I I think what is especially dramatic is that actually concerning cultural heritage and sites of cultural heritage in Kiev, now we can be afraid that they get lost throughout this uh, brother war. Yeah? So what is precious for these different nations uh, is even attacked and not respected. Okay, so I invite Professor Dieter Pohl uh, to take the floor. He will have a presentation, so my uh, my question to the technicians to start with it, and I would like to introduce Professor Pohl. He is at the moment uh, in at the University of Klagenfurt in Austria, Professor of Contemporary History uh, and Eastern and Southeastern Europe. He is a historian specialized in mass violence in the 20th century, Nazi occupations and violent crimes, and the contemporary history of Poland and Ukraine. From 1995 to August 2010, Paul was a researcher and then a department head at the Munich Institute for Contemporary History. After that, he changed to the University of Klagenfurt. Uh, Paul is uh, quite often invited as an expert and was a witness, was an expert witness during the 2009 trial of 
Jan Demjanuk, John Demjanuk, a uh, very famous and controversial process. He publishes, publishes on uh, national socialist uh, politics and uh, the Second World War, latest publications, the rule of the Wehrmacht, German military occupation and local population in Soviet Union. This is my free translation, so I will quote it in German. Die Herrschaft der Wehrmacht, deutsche Militärbesatzung und einheimische Bevölkerung in der Sowjetunion, 1941 bis 1944. And um, nationalsozialistische Verbrechen, 1939 bis 1945, published last year, so National Socialist Crimes, 1939-1945. Professor Pohl, you have the floor. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Eri Franke. Thank you for the invitation to the organizers, especially my friend Burkhard Olczowski and his Polish colleagues. So, this morning we try to apply a more historiographical approach to our subject. So, it's a little bit a different perspective than the last days, is at least my impression, but I think it's a good supplement for what we heard and gives some maybe new perspectives. When Russia attacked the Ukraine again in February 2022, it came of course as a surprise to most of the observers. And of course now the search for motives started. There was a talk, for example, that Putin was an enigma, how could he change his policy, and so on and so forth. But the more one studies Russian politics and discourses over the last decades, the clearer the high continuity of concepts and in part also of their protagonists becomes. And this has, I argue, been the case for decades. And this applies especially to the Ukraine policy of Russia but also to imperial ambitions and the politics of history, Geschichtspolitik. In the following, I will attempt to trace some of the origins of the current Russian war propaganda formula of Nazism, which allegedly prevails in the Ukraine. Since the current Russian leadership was strongly politically socialized during the 1970s and early 1980s, I think it is necessary to start there. The Soviet discourse on so-called Ukrainian nationalism is, of course, older. It dates from the Second World War, the last phase of the war, and especially the immediate post-war period when the Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA, was fought in the Western territories, approximately up till 1948, but the last fights lasted uh, way into the 1950s. Here in particularly, the term Banderovtsi or Banderivtsi in Ukrainian was introduced a little bit in a, analogous to Vlasovtsi for Russian collaborators, which is not so common as Banderovtsi. And this term has still a meaning in the anti-Ukrainian discourse. After the defeat of the UPA in the late 40s, early 50s, these formula temporarily lost their uh, formulas lost their significance. Rather, it is known that Ukraine underwent a revaluation from the late 1950s onwards with a partial liberalization of cultural policy and a limited Ukrainianization of the public sphere. This is, as is well known, mainly associated with the Ukrainian Communist Party leader, Petro Shelest, which you see on the left side here. However, soon after Khrushchev's overthrow in 1964, this limited liberalization was gradually reversed. And for example, Ukrainian dissidents were increasingly criminalized. An important turning point was certainly the appointment of Volodymyr Shebitsky as first secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party in 1972 which you see together with Brezhnev here on the right photograph. He pursued an active policy of de-Ukrainianization. 
At the same time, the party leadership in Moscow had been working since the end of the 1960s on a new concept of the so-called Soviet people, Sovietsky Narod, which was to lead to a fusion of the nationalities through a phase of rapprochement. This was then also laid down in the new Soviet constitution of 1977, and Russian became the absolute leading language in all areas. In the context of the anti-Ukrainian turn at the beginning of the 1970s, the formula of bourgeois Ukrainian nationalism was revalued. This had a double function. Internally, all cultural autonomy efforts were to be discredited, and externally, the Ukrainian uh, exile in North America was attacked. As an international factor which came into play from the mid-1970s onwards, the governments in the United States and Canada began to search for Ukrainian collaborators in Nazi German crimes who had immigrated in their countries right after the war. Soviet agencies offered their assistance to North American authorities in legal investigations, but at the same time used this to attack Ukrainian nationalism especially in the exile. The cooperation went even as far that in 1948, a Ukrainian guard who had worked in a German death camp was extradited from the United States to the Soviet Union. This is Fedor Fedorenko. Uh, you see him, unfortunately, not very good in this newspaper article at the uh, left. Fedorenko himself was sentenced to death and executed by a Soviet court in 1986. The most famous case, however, is certainly that of Ivan Demyanyuk, which you see on the right, which dragged on for decades. I think the investigations began in 77. And as has been mentioned, in 2009, he stood trial in Munich, where I was the historical expert at that time. This search for collaborators in Nazi crimes met with a certain positive response from Western liberal public which at the same time had been increasingly concerned with German mass crimes, and especially the Holocaust from the late 1970s on. You know, this TV series was shown in, in the United States in 78, and in Germany and Austria in 1979. In this context, Soviet propaganda brochures were published in, inside the Soviet Union, and in some cases also in North America. Here you have two cases, one internal, Swastika Nasutanach, this was directed against the Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholic Church. You see the priest and the SS man, with SS Galicia. The more interesting is the right one, Lest We Forget, which was published on a pseudonym in Canada, Mikhail Khanushak, I don't know whether he actually existed, and also showed the crimes of the Ukrainian nationalists in collaboration with the uh, Germans. These brochures intended to document the criminal activities of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, famous OUN, but also of the Greek Catholic Church in Western Ukraine. What is striking here is that these brochures contained numerous documents that were actually not available for research, but in secret, space uh, shasti, and so on, in archives, and they were obviously compiled by the KGB. It is also striking that all these kind of propaganda was focusing on the Holocaust and not so much on, which I consider the worst crimes of the collaborators, the UPA massacres of Poles in Volhynia in Eastern Galicia in 1943, 1944. This was also a matter of Polish historiog historiography and uh, propaganda at that time. As we all know, East-West relations deteriorated rapidly after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. From the point of view of the Soviet leadership, a connection to Ukrainian nationalism also arose from this new context of the new Cold War. The Reagan administration from 1981 on explicitly sought proximity to anti-communist forces in exile. Among other things, Ronald Reagan, like his successor, 
Bush Sr. invited the so-called anti-Bolshevik bloc of nations, ABN, to the White House, an organization that was not only aligned against the Soviet Union, but also explicitly against Russia's dominance. The Russians themselves had NTS, Narodo Trudavoy Sayuz, I don't know what the actual abbreviation means. The ABN was then led by Yaroslav Stitsko, which you see here a little bit with Reagan, see on the back, but with Bush, you see him a, a little bit better. And of course, lots of Ukrainians know Stitsko, who was uh, a high-ranking own office, official during the war, and he proclaimed the Ukrainian puppet government under Hitler's domination in end of June 1941, the so-called act of state building in Lviv on, on the market. There's a memorial plaque. And the RBN was full of right-wing extremists like Stitsko, and presumably also included war criminals. A second element that played a role in Soviet historical policy in these years was the revision of the cri criticism of Stalin. Since approximately 1968-69, critical approaches in historical policy were increasingly pushed back, especially, for example, at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. This included a consistently apologetic view of the so-called Great Patriotic War, which was pushed above all by Brezhnev himself, who made himself a war hero. You know, all these photographs with the war medals and so on. And he wrote his war memoirs and so on. So he, I think he was a political commissar in, in an army or in a uh, southern front, as far as I remember. Implicitly, the assessment of Stalin was again turned to the positive, especially on the occasion of his 19th birthday in 1969, there was an internal discussion whether to rehabilitate Stalin, and 10 years later in 1979, as you know, Stalin falsified his year of birth. He was born in 1878, and not 79. We don't know why, but <laughs> it uh, nevertheless is uh, important. Neo-Stalinist tendencies could not be overlooked. This also affected the reception of Stalin's expansionist policy especially in 1939, 1940, and from 1944 onwards. One must not forget that the Soviet Union returned to an increasingly neo-imperialist policy from the 1970s onwards. And this is often overlooked, also especially in the current discussion. Despite the miserable economic situation within the country, international influence was extended further and further to Vietnam, as we know, to Ethiopia, to Afghanistan, and increasingly also to post-colonial Africa, like Angola, Mozambique, for example. And the latter policy re re during the uh, uh, resurfaced during the mid-2010s. We actually see it, the activities of the Wagner Group, for example, in Mali and elsewhere. It was precisely in this atmosphere of the new Cold War in an aggressive anti-Ukrainian discourse that today's KGB functionaries were trained and made their careers. The institutional context must also be taken into account. The KGB had experienced a serious crisis during the 1950s with the fall and execution of Lavrenti Beria, and it only slowly regained its key position within the Soviet system. The effects of the CSCE, the uh, Conference of, on Security and Cooperation in Europe, certainly played a role in this, as all communist states were now expanding their secret police apparatuses in order to control the rising dissident movement. We still know very little about the history of the KGB during the 1970s and 1980s, but evidence suggests that Andropov, the KGB chief, was deliberately building up cadres to place in all areas of the state and economy, who were not meant to make their career inside the KGB, but in state uh, organizations or state and party organizations. The high point was certainly reached with Andropov's election as general secretary in 1982, e even if he only remained in office for a short term since he had cancer. At the middle and lower levels, however, the influence of the KGB cadres remained. 
and quite a few adapted to the new conditions of perestroika. Finally, the Communist Party was broken up in 1991, but the KGB was merely reorganized and remained. It can also be assumed that the worldviews within the KGB were only changed to a very limited extent by these changes. In fact, mainly in the area of privatization of state economy, in which KGB cadres were successfully involved, and we all know that Putin started to get familiar with uh, cap the capitalist economy already when he was in Dresden, so during the 1980s. The anti-Ukrainian historical policy was then resumed relatively soon after the KGB military complex, how I would call it, seized power under Putin in the year 2000. Especially since 2004, Orange Revolution, and more massively since 2014, Ukrainian nationalism has been equated by Soviet history policies with mass violence and collaboration. In the process, of course, numerous attacks reflected the upgrading of OUN and UPA within Ukraine itself, especially at the end of Yushchenko administration. He made Bandera uh, a hero of Ukraine, I think, in 2010 before he left office, and then after the beginning of the war in uh, 2014. Again, it is striking that not only the Russian State Archive Administration but also the F FSB diligently published documents incriminating Ogun and Upa. On the left one, you see a, one this theory and practice of Western Ukrainian uh, nationalism in the documents of NKBD. That's, of course, from a uh, FSB archive. And then on the right one, this is interesting. You might know this institution, Istriceskaya Pamyat, which is a pro-Putin pro uh, history propaganda organization. And this is called the Everyday Terror, Povsidnivnost Terrora. And it's not the terror of the NKVD against the UPA, it's the terror of the UPA against the uh, local population, which is documented. These are from about 2010. Finally, the question arises why the official Russian war propaganda constantly speaks of Nazism and not of fascism or just Ukrainian nationalism. In this case, I can only speculate. We see here, for example, a uh, um, sign of an organization called Mir Bez Nazisma, which was established in 2010, which was an international network which still exists and was targeted in first place against the Baltic states, but switched after a while uh, also against uh, Ukraine. And there you have this term. It seems to me that the main target here is a Western audience that has a more negative connotation of this term than the ubiquitous fascism terminology. Moreover, the recourse to the common Allied policy of 1945 is visible when denazification and demilitarization were the core aims of the Allied policies towards Germany. Obviously, however, we are currently dealing with neo-Stalinist formulas that also have elements of neo-Stalinist policies. The westward expansion against Poland, against the Baltics, and Andrei Kalyeznikov rightly mentioned the, the winter war against Finland, which is very similar to what is happening uh, right now, including the mistakes of Stalin at that point, which were in a certain way repeated by Putin. But it also included alleged cleansing of conquered territories, very rapid annexations, terror, and deportations, as in 1939-1940 in eastern Poland and the Baltic states. Stalin was able to push through this westward expansion in large parts in 1943-1944, even in consensus with the Western Allies. It is to be hoped that Putin will not succeed the same way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Pohl, to uh, remind us and uh, present us this study of the origins of uh, the uh, current propaganda. 
And um, I invite now also our panelists, also the public, to ask immediate questions to the paper. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Good morning, I'm Anneli Utegabani from Berlin. Uh, Professor Paul, uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I wanted to ask you how do you assess uh, Bush's chicken speech in Kiev in 1991? Uh, actually, I can, actually, I cannot answer this question. I know about the speech, but I don't know what he said, so uh, it's... Uh, it's was only obvious that there was also turn to the Western public in a certain sense because the Babi Babinyam memorial was replaced, especially for this purpose. You probably know that there is uh, this strange uh, 1970s um, a Soviet memorial of Babinyam, which uh, is dedicated to the famous formula of uh, peaceful Soviet citizens, and then the menorah was established for Bush. Uh, but unfortunately, I know the, don't know the content of... He warned there in that speech against suicidal nationalism of the Ukrainians. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, I think, a, a formula which is very... I would say, uh, uh, manifest within Western discourse on Ukraine. You have this, for example, this uh, um, discourse of continuous Ukrainian anti-Semitism. You know, Khmelnytsky uprising, the pogroms of 1919, and so uh, this uh, uh, supposed uh, ingredient of, of Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian uh, uh, self-identity with anti-Jewish feelings. Today we know from uh, opinion service that Ukraine is one, Ukraine is one of the countries with the least anti-Semitic um, uh, occurrence in, uh, in Europe. But um, as far as the connection with this picture I showed with Stetsko and, and Bush, it meant, uh, I would say uh, in the Bush case he didn't know whom, whom he was talking uh, there. In, uh, I mean, you know that Reagan pushed in really active uh, anti-Bolshevik uh, uh, agenda, and uh, you can see this, for example, in the uh, Secret Service was very closely related, and there were direct connections between the CIA and in these emigre uh, organizations. I think this declined under Bush, so Bush was just presented with this uh, uh, representative of the Ukraine exile, so I don't think, think he actually knew uh, with, with whom he was talking and whom he was sending this card right now, but that's my interpretation. Very interesting, and uh, uh, what you have said here brought to my mind some events uh, uh, since the First World War in, uh, uh, concerning the Romanian foreign policy. As a matter of fact, since Brezlitovsk in Bucharest has been realized that uh, uh, there is a de facto uh, uh, Ukrainian statehood and an entire uh, endeavor to get uh, uh, their own state. And uh, uh, it was possible in such a way, realizing that, for Bucharest to develop a two ways of politics. One, uh, supporting Ukrainian uh, national movement, for example, in uh, 20 up to 20, Two, three, I think, Magno and Petliura got uh, uh, safe heavens in Romania, being uh, given uh, weapons and uh, logistics for developing their own struggle on the Ukrainian territory. And at the same time, from time to time, Romanian authorities, Romanian foreign policy played <coughs> with the Russians against. And this, it seems to me, at least, Transnistria had been, how to say, uh, uh, invented, Transnistria of today, uh, in 24, uh, due to the fact that it was a certain, uh, how to say, uh, 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 debate within the Bolshevik uh, uh, leadership, 
because uh, uh, Litvino, for example, and it's, uh, it is a fascinating uh, exchange of letters between Litvino and Rakowski concerning how to play and to play against such kind of Romanian politics. My question is, if uh, such a realization like in Bucharest that there is a certain pillar to play against Russian imperialism, namely Ukrainian nationalism, had been realized also in other uh, neighbors uh, uh, on the eastern, on the western flank of Russia in, uh, in the interwar period and even after the Second World War, because from that point of view there are also other very, very interesting developments concerning the problem of Bessarabia between Soviet Union and Romania. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not a uh, specialist in this area, but if you look at the other neighbors, I'm, I only know about Germany, which is not a direct neighbor, but Poland, and there's this principle of uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, <laughs> and you know that the Poles very much suppressed uh, Ukrainian nationalism and the own, uh, especially from 1930 on in Galicia and 37 in Volhynia. So this was very anti-Ukrainian, uh, and there were certain Polish aspirations, you know, the Pilsudski uh, concept of reestablishing the old Rzeczpospolita and so on, and it's still on the debate whether uh, what happened in 1920 <laughs> when he attacked Kiev. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, there were close relations between the German uh, counterintelligence, especially in their own but this was very manipulative. There's a good book by Frank Kolchevsky on that, 1,000 pages, which details all uh, German-Ukrainian uh, contacts. Uh, he worked on that for 20 years, so uh, you, that's the uh, consequence of working with computers. You have a lot of material <laughs> and write big books. Um, and, but it was reverse. It was against Poland. We support the Ukrainians, and we support the Ukrainians a little bit against Soviet, uh, the Soviet uh, Union. I would say there's a general pattern, especially in the interwar period, that the Ukrainians were used as a tool. They themselves were not important. Ukrainian state, uh, statehood was not important. But if they could use, they were useful, and then they were left, more or less. And you see this same reappears with the early Cold War, when uh, Western intelligence services, first the uh, MI6, and then the CIA and its forerunners, very heavily relied on all these underground movements in the western part of the Soviet Union. We heard about the Lithuanian Forest Brothers, for example, at close contacts to western. And, uh, but again, it was not about re-establishing Baltic statehood, about establishing uh, Ukrainian nation. It was about the fight in the early Cold War, how can we destabilize uh, the Soviet Union, lots of them were, most of them were caught, not the least, by, uh, through the channel of the Cambridge Five, which more or less uh, uh, uncovered that to the Soviets and executed and so on, and they, they didn't actually play a role. And it took a long time. I mean, the, what we see right now is a consequence of the, all this longevity, not only on the Russian side, from Russian czarist imperialism, we heard that through Soviet imperialism, but also on the Western side. So Ukraine was not important, and not even after 2014, as we realized, and it's only now that the Ukrainian as an identity, as a subject of history, uh, comes into mind. Thank you very much for the questions and uh, elaborating uh, by Dieter Pohl and giving the answers. So now we continue with our papers, if you allow, and uh, I invite Dr. Jörg Moret to take the floor. Uh, I guess here in the public he's already well known because he has been <laughs> with us since Wednesday and uh, running a lot of discussions because he has a quite difficult and delicate position at the moment. He is uh, the director of the Museum Berlin Karl Horst of a very special place for Soviet-German and Russian-German relationships. But he has been the director since 2009 and has been cooperating 
with all the changements of new exhibitions, of uh, new uh, publication projects. He is a historian and um, he was a research associate at the memorial sites Sachsenhausen and Bautzen before starting his job in Berlin Karlshorst, following different trips, study trips, research trips to Petersburg and Moscow. He received his PhD at the Chair of Eastern European History of Ruhr University in Bochum. I wanted to quote you uh, as an introduction, a short passage, a short paragraph of a declaration um, a statement by the Museum Authorities uh, in Karlshorst, published in April 2022. Our museum was founded in 1994, jointly by the Federal Republic of Germany and the Russian Federation in the legal form of an association. The National World War II Museums of Ukraine and Belarus joined as members in 1997-98. We would like to emphasize this diversity. Almost 30 years of continuous cooperation with our Eastern European colleagues have made our museum a forum for very different perspectives on our common history. In view of the current war situation, however, it is unclear whether and how we will be able to build on this in the future. For a long time now, we have been discussing our name as a German-Russian museum because this name, although historically grown, does not adequately reflect our actual work. We remember all Soviet victims of the German war of extermination, regardless of their nationality. In future, we will use our name, Museum Berlin Karlshorst, which is registered in the official public records. So, you have the floor, Jörg, and of course you're not uh, discussing now the museum, but it is in the background of your paper on Militarization of Russian Historical Research and Education. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, my, my paper is not about the, the, the mu museum, but uh, welcome. We have a coffee break and so on. And <laughs> so I tried to, ah, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yeah, it's about militarization of Russian research and education. So it's a bit more about education than research, but um, yes, um, due to my job, I, I was um, watching all the, the yeah, changes in, in Russian education policy, I would say. So first point I want to make is um, remembering World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, in the Russian view and the Soviet view, which is a bit different. Um, remembering the war, the, Great Patriotic War was always based on the veterans. So there were the eyewitnesses, the truth were in the hands of the eyewitnesses and everything talking in public about the war was based on the veterans. Of course, uh, this was uh, framed by the state, by the Soviet state. It was not a free speech about um, the war, but nevertheless, this is one very important point, um, the truth. Who knows the truth about history? the veterans, the eyewitnesses. And um, when the Soviet state broke away, um, the veterans were still there. So there, they were the authorities to tell us the story about World War II, the Great Patriotic War. Of course, um, this was an, um, yeah, a framed narrative about heroes, about the good things, and so on and so on. And, um, but this is very important for my, my, for my f first idea or yeah, first step to my, for my paper. Um, in the 90s, after the break, breakdown of Soviet Union, um, it, there was a kind of, of vacuum, um, but nevertheless, um, the private storytelling, the private narrative about World War II in the families or the dark sides of the history what, or of, of that, what, what the veterans um, <coughs> lived through, wasn't told in public. The, um, the rem Remembering World War II became a bit more liberal and several forms, but um, the state at the end was the, the stakeholder. So this is what I uh, want um, to show you briefly, how the state, the Russian state, and it begins with the era of Putin, uh, I would say, how the Russian state uh, succeed in, in becoming the owner of the history. So he was the player, the, the storyteller about 
remembering how to remember World War II and what to remember and how to tell the story. Um, and the, the, the focus is, and I think this is really like a, um, yeah, like a motive. Uh, when, when Putin started in, um, or other hand, in 2001, there was launched a program so-called Patriotic Education. So this is still existing every five years. Uh, this is renewed like a program for, for schools, for teaching, yeah, teaching whatever, teaching patriotism. So first of all, there's, there was a need to have programs for patriotic education. And the next step, how we will do this. So when it started, when this program was launched in 2001, it based on the veterans. Still, they were still there, still alive. And um, it was the, the society was was used to 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 look to hear to the veterans, okay. And it was focused on on May on 9th of May um, every year, of course. During the year, it was not so important, but nevertheless, in the in the program of um, education, the the fundament uh, the, the the base was the veterans, and um, so. What are the main three points of this program? Um, first of all, to implement how to love your, your country, your homeland, Russia. Next point, uh, to know the truth about history of Russia. And the third point, to be aware to, yeah, to defend your country, to stay for your country. So the first point, um, love your country. Um, generally, uh, the Russian state tries to, and, and he succeeded it after 20 years, I would say, try to, um, to focus only on the, on the proud moments in, in Russian history, on the, on, on the good parts of history are told. And um, the aim is that the, the whole Russian history, not only the Soviet history, the whole Russian history is one continuum. So like a flow and everything be became fine because there were good leaders at, in the end. Putin is nowadays the leader of this Russian history. And everything, what could be not so good, a caesura, a breaking point, a crisis, whatever, was not told. Or there was a reinterpretation so that this fits into a, a continuum. What we can see in, in Russia, there are uh, nowadays there are around um, yeah, exhibitions you can say Russia my historia Russia my history it's made in a uh, multimedia me medial um, way very very professional made um, but uh, it's yeah this is the continuum of a good Russian history shown in I think 15 places now in in Russia um, and that that is a good or can I say, example for this aim to have a good continuum of, uh, a, continuum of, of a good history. The second point is um, then when there is a good Russian history, then there are always are enemies. We have to fight for our countries. And um, yeah, very often in the Russian history, this enemy was in the West. So the West, and nowadays it's NATO, but um, this uh, SEMA or, or this, this um, setting of good and bad, uh, we and the others, we and the enemies and so on, uh, is trained in this uh, view on history. Yeah, and uh, uh, to love your country, that means uh, you have to fight against these enemies. Another question is, of course, where is this, this Russia or this Rus Russian people? So the territory. And this is focusing on the, on the yeah, imperial state uh, before, uh, yeah, Imperial state, the Soviet Union, the uh, Cherish, uh, the, the, the older Russian Imperium, and um, but it's not so clear. Um, the next point, uh, uh, yeah, I will come back to this is of course where the Russians are. So, but this, this is a f fluent, uh, um, fluent frontiers, you can say. And, um, and the last point in, in, in this. Um, yeah, and this uh, development is that, that Putin at the end, and we, sh we, we have seen it in the last years, is Putin is acting as an historian, 
who is telling us, or the, the Russians, um, the history. So when he writes about uh, the Kiev, Kiev Rus uh, and the, the victory in Great Patriotic War and so on, not as a president, as a politician, as an, he, he writes as an historian. Of course, he is the, the leader, the president as well. So this is the next point. Um, 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 what, what do we have to know about history? Yeah, Putin is, is showing us, or he is, he's uh, the one who is, uh, he, he tells the history. And what he does not tell, that means don't speak about it. And uh, in this point, it's very important that there is a truth, so there is a falsification as well. You all know the, the, all the laws and so on, step by step by step, um, laws against falsification of history, uh, in the other way round, that means there's the truth, and who knows the truth at the end, the president, the history. And uh, I won't talk about a long time about research in, in universities and schools, but this is all connected, that um, the focus or the, the questions which, which, uh, which are legal, you can say, the questions for our scholars uh, to, to ask and to have a look on in, in universities and so on, become so narrow that the, at the moment this is not not possible to to ask yeah not allowed questions how to say for example the price for the victory when I started my job in in Karlshorst 10 15, no 14 years ago it was very common to, to ask okay yeah we win the war but for what price so they forgot about it well, it's not not uh, um, this question is uh, don't don't ask this question. Uh, this is the point. Yeah, a good example for that is Park Patriot, uh, founded in 2014, close to, to, to Moscow. Vajena Patriotiski Park Kulturi Oteha. So, a military patriotic uh, park for culture and recreation. So, have fun and learn something about history. And um, really, it's, it's a playground, there are uh, events, music, and so on and so on. Um, handing with weapons and reenactment. Reenactment became very famous just to, to, to feel the history. And of course, in, in, a, in a certain se se settlement, uh, um, for example, in this Park Patriot, open up, uh, you can make uh, the, the uh, attack the Reichstag, a storm on the Reichstag. So uh, you, you, you're taking part in the last step, um, uh, winning the great patriotic war here in Berlin by uh, capturing the Reichstag. Um, so it's emotion. It's about emotion. Uh, and another point is uh, a very good and uh, is uh, occupying history by the, by the state. Another example is the um, um, immortal regiment, um, a good idea. So uh, in Tomsk, the people thought, OK, um, the veterans are not alive, uh, but we want to remember our, our um, grandfathers and whoever, so it's possible to, to print out, because everything is, can be found in the internet, to print out a photo, or we have a photo by our own, show it, and we as a regiment, as a, as a group, uh, going on the streets in my, uh, May, May 9th of May, and uh, showing our, um, yeah, our veterans, our family veterans, our family. So uh, this is a kind of grassroots uh, um, movement. Yeah, what did Putin uh, in 2015, he was in the front of this Biesmertny uh, Polk, of this uh, immortal regiment in Moscow. That means, okay, now it's legal, the president is in front of this movement. And this is, uh, yeah, in, in, in Germany, this uh, movement is now uh, known as a yeah, state action made by, by Putin, which is not true. But this is the mechanism how to occupy history. The last point, defending your country, um, how can I say, the, the Russians, or what in this education is shown, uh, the Russians are the, the winners in history. So uh, everything came to a good end. And in this point, or in this perspective, of course, May 45 is the, the best moment ever. Um, the Soviet Union really was a winner and uh, was a great power sitting with the other great powers at, at the table, first of all. Potsdam, Berlin Conference, 45, and then uh, in the United Nations, 
Security Council. So uh, Russia or Soviet Union in, in, in this point is back and this is the place to be. So this is uh, the focus still on uh, Russia is great and this is our, our status to be um, in the circle of, of the great powers. And in the bipolar world of Cold War, it were Soviet Union and the other United States. We're not talking about China, uh, but uh, so this was very helpful. So we are one, we are one player of two. And uh, this is still a, a name. The turning point in all, ah, and, um, and coming back to the youth, um, in 2005, a uh, youth movement was, uh, was founded, NASHI, ours. And this is okay, always uh, focusing on NASHI, uh, our soldiers. So these are ours. And our youth is close to our soldiers in World, 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 World War II. And the next point is they, they, the, the self-understanding was anti-fascistic. And this is a focus on, on the uh, orange revolution in Ukraine or around. There's movement and these are neo-fascists, whatever. And we as the proud Russian youth, Nashi, uh, we are, we are anti-fascistic. So there's a, a, a link between remembering World War II and these, um, yeah, themes of good and bad and fascists and fighting against these fascists. This is our historical response or experience. Yeah, the turning point, of course, is 2014 in, in political sense. Um, and, uh, but uh, what, is, uh, what is seen, the, the narrative about uh, protecting our people, our Russian people, yeah, the, um, the peaceful Soviet people, uh, which is nationalized by the peaceful Russian people on so-called our territory, or it's never, it, it doesn't matter where, where the territory, where the frontiers of Russian Federation is, when there are Russians, we have to protect them. And this is a copy of the, um, of the story uh, of, of uh, the Great Patriotic War. There's an attack by fascists and we have to defend our people. And um, yeah, it's, it's going on and I'm have a look on, on, on my watch. So um, the last, point in this uh, development is uh, founding the Yun Army in 2016, uh, the Young Army, Youth Army, uh, and this is military ed education at, it, at its best. And, and this is uh, connected uh, or yeah, it's implemented in the program of, of um, patriotic education, it's part of patriotic education, and um, it's a uh, radicalization, I would say, in this long-term uh, view bringing together all these points I, I showed you uh, with really military training. This is what, what they do, and um, it works. And it, at the end, of course, uh, history is a weapon for, for the Russian state, for the government. Uh, it is not made by this educational program. This is only a result of, of, the, politi of the politics of the Russian um, education, but uh, the result is that it is possible now for, for the government, for the Russian government, that there is no critics uh, about, or um, nearly no critics about uh, the war. Everyone is, is fine with uh, this look that is, it, is, it is needed to, to fight against fascists wherever. So this is... Um, yeah, what we felt in the museum as well, but uh, I want to show you how the education in the Russian Federation for the last 20 years uh, switched to, yeah, to a weapon for the government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, we are actually running out a little bit of time, so we will leave the questions after the speech of uh, Mr. Alexander Osipian. And um, <clears throat> Alexander is, as I said before, an Ukrainian scholar. His hometown is Donetsk, but he has been for several years doing his research at German universities, currently in Leipzig at the Leibniz Institute for History and Culture of Eastern Europe. He graduated from Czernivtsi National University and holds a PhD in history from Donetsk National University. He was a visiting professor at the Justus Liebig Universität in Gießen, 
And uh, the two last years, he was an Andrew Mellon guest researcher at the Center for East European Studies of Free University Berlin. He published uh, lately several articles on the topic of his speech. I would like to mention two of them. Historical Myth, Enemy Images, and Regional Identity in the Donbass Insurgency, Spring 2014, in the Journal of Soviet and Post-Soviet Politics and Society, and in the East European Politics and Societies uh, Journal, he published uh, the article Regional Diversity and Divided Memories in Ukraine, Contested Past as Electoral Resource, 2004-2010. Okay, so the floor is for Alexander and okay. his paper on the weaponization of the history of the Second World War in Russia-Ukraine conflict 2014-2022. Yeah, uh, thank you for this uh, kind introduction and uh, many thanks to the uh, German and Polish uh, organizers of this uh, great conference. Vielen Dank und dziękuję uh, bardzo. So, uh, I also would like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, Andrew Mellon Foundation for uh, scholarship. I enjoyed two uh, years in Berlin being uh, affiliated with the uh, Osteuropa Institute in uh, uh, Freie Universität Berlin. So uh, my today's presentation is the uh, outcome of this uh, two years uh, research stay in Berlin. So, uh, uh, when I got the uh, invitation for this conference, my uh, original idea was to uh, uh, deliver a paper uh, explaining uh, uh, Putin's uh, claim of uh, demilitarization and uh, denazification of Ukraine uh, through uh, analysis of uh, Russian foreign policy uh, mainly Putin's uh, uh, speeches and his uh, two famous publications. Uh, but then when I uh, found that the uh, uh, conference uh, will be uh, held um, at this uh, excellent museum, so I changed my opinion because uh, uh, this paper I already delivered uh, two years ago at a conference in Krakow organized by uh, Professor Riedel who is uh, present today at the conference. And so my today's presentation uh, will be uh, devoted to explaining uh, demilitarization and denazification uh, through uh, uh, material objects, because uh, now we are uh, in museum. I will also devote some uh, attention to uh, museum exhibitions organized in uh, Russia in 2022 to explain uh, Russia's military invasion in Ukraine to uh, Russian public and also how uh, museum, Russian museum personnel are engaged uh, in these uh, events. Okay, good. So, uh, Russia's President, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Russian mass media represent uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict in Donbas in 2014 and Russia's full-scale uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, last year as a sequel of the Second World War or Great Patriotic War. So this paper examines how justification of Russia's invasion of Ukraine was developed through Second World War symbols and performances used by pro-Russian insurgents in Ukraine, the Russian army, as well as Russian museum personnel in current exhibitions. So the so-called uh, Euromaidan revolution in Kiev was represented by Russian mass media and pro-Russian activists in Southeast Ukraine as neo-Nazis coup d'etat with the interim government blamed as the fascist junta. So this elaborated narrative of the fascist threat was employed during the insurgency in East Ukrainian Donbas in spring 2014. So the claim of federalization of Ukraine, then demand of referendum, secession from Ukraine and appeals to 
Putin to send the Russian troops to Ukraine were legitimized by the spread of fears that Ukrainian fascists are approaching the Donbas to persecute the locals supported of the ousted President Yanukovych. So the celebrations of the Victory Day on 9 of May 2014 were used to mobilize the masses to vote on the secessionist referendum in Donetsk and Luhansk on 11 of May, just two days after uh, Victory Day. So in Mariupol, the celebrations were used by local paramilitary insurgents to attack the central police department. So uh, one of the main symbols of this uh, uh, insurgency of uh, 2014, uh, called uh, in Russian mass media as Russian Spring in eastern and southeastern uh, southern Ukraine, was a, a victory banner raised by Red Army soldiers on the Reichstag uh, on the 1st May of 1945. So the banner became the main symbol of the great victory in accordance with bill passed by Russia's parliament on 7 May 2007. Then this symbol was used by pro-Russian forces in Ukraine in 2014. For instance, here you can see pro-Russian demonstration in Odessa on uh, 10th of April. So most of demonstrators, they have a victory banner so the next image, pro-Russian meeting in uh, South Ukrainian city of Mykolaiv, uh, hold near the monument of the great patriotic war, and again many pro-Russian activists there uh, having uh, Russian banners, Russian empire banners, but also a victory banner. The next reason of using this victory banner is justifying defection. For instance, Alexander Khodakovsky is a former commander of the Alpha Special Unit of the Security Service of Ukraine, SBU, in Donetsk Oblast. In May 2014, he left Ukrainian state service and became the leader of insurgent battalion Vostok. So uh, he is uh, posing uh, with a uh, background of this victory banner, so in a way justifying his defection. So uh, another famous image of uh, uh, Rodina Mat or uh, uh, Motherland so, uh, was used by insurgents in the uh, billboards in uh, Donetsk in summer 2014, uh, uh, inviting locals to join uh, the uh, uh, insurgent militia. In some cases, the material objects of the Second World War were used by the insurgents to prove their direct connection to the holy war against fascism. For instance, on a screen you see uh, in July 2014, the insurgents of Battalion Step took from the museum in the town of Yanakievo a banner of the 14th rifle Yanakievo Danube division with the legend, Death to German Occupants. Another uh, example, in June 2014, the insurgents took from a pedestal a memorial tank in the town of Kostantinivka in Donetsk Gebiet. They mounted a modern machine gun on the old tank. And, uh, sorry, uh, on its fuel tanks, they wrote on Lvov and on Kiev, thus expressing their plans to attack in future the too strong hold of Ukrainian fascism. By writing the legend, they made reference to the siege of Berlin when the Red Army soldiers wrote on their tanks, cannons, and elderly shells on Berlin. So here you see uh, another examples from 1945, uh, personally to Hitler, to Berlin, to Reichstag, uh, in this way, the insurgents in Donbas pretended to reenact the Second World War, this time against the Ukrainian fascists. Another example is from uh, Russia. You, you see here a Russian girl with Russian flag uh, and with a car transformed in a sort of uh, old Soviet tank, T-34. 
uh, with the same inscription, the same slogan on Berlin. So it's uh, taken in 2015. So in the end, only few insurgent units tried to appropriate some material symbols of the Second World War since the majority of them were busy with looting the banks and auto shops. So the performance of the Second World War by the insurgents culminated on August 24, 2014. That day, Ukrainians celebrated their Independence Day with military parade in Kiev. So alternative parade was organized that day in Donetsk, held by insurgents. So in Donetsk, they staged a parade of the defeated, a parade that mocked the Ukrainian army and celebrated the death of uh, and imprisonment of uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Up to 100 captive Ukrainian soldiers, policemen, and volunteers were marched through the Donetsk Central Street. They were guarded by insurgents with guns, their bayonets fixed. So about 1,000 onlookers shouted fascist and murderers and pelted the prisoners with empty beer, bottles, eggs, and tomatoes. So the mockery parade performed by the insurgents in Donetsk was the exact copy, so of much lesser scale, of the parade of the defeated German troops held in Moscow on July 17 in 1944, when almost 60,000 German prisoners of war were marched through the Moscow center. Then street cleaning machines followed the column spraying water onto the street in a theatrical gesture to indicate the men were unclean. So in case of Moscow in 1944, these uh, street cleaning machines were used for hygienic reasons because there were 60,000 uh, German prisoners of war marching through the city. But in case of Donetsk, there were about 70, 80 uh, uh, Ukrainian prisoners of war and uh, the, cleaning the street cleaning machines in Donetsk in 2014 were used just to make uh, exact reference that uh, these Ukrainian prisoners of war, they are uh, fascists. And we are doing the same as in Moscow in 1944. The, the documentary of 1944 parade was constantly used in the late USSR in course of the Victory Day celebrations and thereby deeply embedded in the memory of its citizens, particularly the older and middle-aged generations. So Russian mass media emphasized the similarity of both parades of 1944 and 2014 in order to explain the main message to a younger generation lacking the Soviet-style memory of the Second World War. So the victory banner was again used in Russian invasion in 2022. So here you see a uh, victory banner raised in the uh, Ukrainian city of uh, Kherson, which was occupied by uh, Russian troops. So again, another example, the victory banner on the Mount uh, Kremianets in the city of Izum in eastern Ukraine uh, when occupied by Russian army. Uh, East Ukrainian city of Lysychansk, in July 2022, Russian soldiers with the victory uh, banner uh, storming the uh, local uh, uh, city hall. So in that case, again, propaganda used this as a direct reference to uh, Red Army and victory banner in Berlin raised over Reichstag. So you see the same... Uh, uh, the uh, Russian soldier posing in Lysychansk with a victory banner raised over the ruins of uh, Lysychansk city council. And uh, uh, famous photos of uh, Red Army soldiers posing uh, next to the ruins of uh, Reichstag. 
So the Lysychansk city council uh, as a new uh, Reichstag destroyed by uh, victorious Russian army. Or in other references, uh, red army soldiers posing uh, uh, with the victory banner uh, and uh, uh, destroyed Reichstag on the background. And the same in Lysychansk, victorious Russian soldiers uh, taking uh, pictures with the victory banner uh, and uh, on the background is the uh, ruins of the uh, city hall. So then the victory banner was handed to Viktor Senichkin, an academic secretary of the Victory Museum in Moscow, who arrived to the destroyed Lysychansk just three days after it was uh, taken by Russian troops. Senichkin had delivered the victory banner from Lysychansk to the Victory Museum in Moscow, Musei Pobedy na Poklonnoy Gore. In early May 2022, Viktor Senichkin, along with many Russian historians and museum personnel, was sent to the occupied areas in Ukraine. Their main task is to collect the material evidence of neo-Nazism in Ukraine. So uh, you see uh, Senichkin with uh, Russian soldiers in uh, occupied Mariupol seaport. Then the collected evidence were used for the exhibition, evidences of crimes committed by Ukrainian neo-Nazis and their instigators. So the exhibition was organized by the Russian Historical Society in Moscow, the Victory Museum in Moscow, and Museum of Stalingrad Battle in Volgograd. So again and again references are made that Russian army in Ukraine are fighting a sequel to the Second World War against the Ukrainian fascists this time. Finally, the exhibition in Moscow was opened by Sergei Narishkin, director of the Foreign Intelligence Service, Služba Vnešnje Razvedki of Russia, and at the same time he is head of the Russian Historical Society. So, uh, as uh, my colleagues already uh, said, uh, not only education but uh, uh, research, historical research in uh, many ways in contemporary Russia is patronized by high rank uh, officials, uh, mainly those uh, responsible for uh, defense and security. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for this uh, impression, impressive uh, paper with uh, photographs uh, many of us probably haven't seen and also with this impressive analogy to Second World War iconography. Actually, we are um, already in the spot, in the slot of the coffee break. Uh, we started a little bit later, so if you allow, we can have two questions to the two last speakers or to one of them, and then switch with the discussion into the coffee break. But if there is... Mm -hmm. So... Thank you for the mic. Yes, um, just, I don't know, it's, a quest, it's not a question, but there is a website in uh, German, it's called Nachdenkseiten. And um, they are showing or trying to document uh, from the um, Soviet uh, or the Russian side all these crimes um, are done by the Ukrainians. So it's a part of the conspiracy theory. Um, and that leads me to Mr. Moray. Um, I thank you for your speech because uh, it, it has outlined what I call the technologies of configurating perceptual or patterns. It's, uh, it's, it seems to be very interesting that you could not mention, for instance, Vasily Grossman and his works on Stalingrad and uh, Life and Death, or the Leben und Schicksal. And you could not mention, and I guess it's not even mentioned in your museum, those, those authors uh, of those days that were strictly forbidden to publish their books. Um, Sorry, because we are running out of time. Yeah. Could you pronounce you the question? Yeah, uh, the question is, when did it happen to um, 
um, prohibit all these authors to publish in the, the former Soviet Union, focusing on the Soviet uh, side of the atrocities committed by the Red Army, executions, for instance, for officers and soldiers, in particular in Volgograd and on the Russian fronts, because those defectors were executed by the high-ranking officers and the NKVD or KGB in those days. It's a long story I tell you in the, in the coffee break. Uh, briefly, uh, uh, it started in the 50s, uh, and uh, we just had a lecture in uh, our museum about uh, Vasily Grossman and so, and so on. So um, welcome to our museum. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah, we discuss it in the coffee break. Okay, thank you, thank you. For Thank you. Thank you, Professor Osipian. Uh, I have a question to you which is only slightly, slightly related to your topic, but since you come from the Donetsk Oblast, I would like to pose this question to you. Um, we have had two interesting remarks on the Minsk uh, uh, negotiations. One was by uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov last February or March, who said that there is no use of uh, this casting in this format anymore because the West failed to press Ukraine to take the right decisions. And a very recent remark by uh, our late, our for, my goodness, our former uh, Chancellor Merkel, who said uh, the way we discussed at Minsk uh, was in fact to give Ukraine time to uh, sort of arm uh, its military. Thing. Does it work? Uh -huh. uh, yes, thank you for your uh, interesting uh, question. So, uh, uh, in my view, uh, when uh, Merkel made this uh, recent statement, uh, she just uh, tried to justify uh, herself. Uh, uh, of, course, of course, it was not uh, her uh, uh, decision uh, to uh, deceive Putin in uh, 2014. Uh, I am sure for 100% uh, her idea was to make peace uh, in Eastern Europe. So she and uh, President Olan, they made all possible efforts. And what's going on uh, Lavrov's statement? So I think in that case he is uh, absolutely right that uh, uh, Russia in 2014, 15 and later uh, tried to use France and Germany to press on Ukraine to give up and to uh, follow uh, this uh, uh, Minsk uh, agreement, uh, what, which was um, uh, elaborated by Russia uh, to transform Ukraine in a, a hybrid way in one more Belarus uh, satellite uh, country absolutely dependent uh, of Russia using this uh, uh, insurgents and uh, Russian uh, proxy military forces in Donbas. So thank you. And uh, and finally, this strategy failed, and Lavrov just recognized that uh, uh, Russia need not uh, uh, Minsk agreement, so um, it will act in different way in open military invasion. I would like to ask one last question to you, Alexander. You showed us these um, pictures of Russian soldiers using well-known icons. What about the Ukrainian soldiers? To what kind of icons do they refer when they take pictures of themselves in victory situations or at parades? Can, have you studied this, or is there a similar? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I made no uh, uh, special research on this topic, but of course I follow uh, news, and uh, so mainly I see uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, uh, using uh, Ukrainian national flags, this uh, uh, blue and yellow flag. So, um, uh, but uh, of course uh, these soldiers uh, from different uh, brigades and units, they. Uh, have uh, uh, insignia or chevrons, uh, uh, a multitude of symbols. Uh, they are using some of them uh, making reference as far as to 16th century. Uh, for instance, in 16th century, uh, uh, Russian troops were defeated in the land of present-day Belarus by a Polish hetman 
who was actually Ukrainian aristocrat, uh, Prince Ostrowski, and uh, so some symbols from 16th century are uh, used now in Ukrainian army, but mainly uh, they are uh, new symbols or symbols making reference to uh, Ukrainian uh, uprising army uh, from the time of the Second World War. Thank you. Uh, Soviet Ukrainian separated from the Soviet uh, icons of, of memory in, in 2014. So there's uh, uh, no flag. Um, they switched from the 9th May to the 8th of May. Um, the um, Georgian band Georgios Skilentichka uh, was uh, is not used. Um, uh, there's a poppy and so on and so on. So they're, they're very very. At once, I would say, in 2014, felt apart from all these Soviet topics. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to our panelists, and please continue the discussion, which is never finished, at the coffee break. Thank you.